A ship's crew in the Age of Sail was divided between seamen and daymen, also called idlers. The difference was that seamen kept watch, whereas idlers had duties preventing them from watchkeeping. Idlers included certain officers, in addition to specialists like the sailmaker, cook, and musician. The seamen, those who kept watch, were divided into two large subgroups, larboard watch and starboard watch. These groups rotated between working and relaxing in four-hour shifts. Internally, they were further divided into six groups, three of which handled the front, middle, and back of the ship's deck, respectively. They were the biggest, strongest boys aboard, usually older than 25, assigned to handling anchors and bow lines. It was hard, but a similar workload to a professional mover. The unfortunate cousins of these deck men were the top men, also called Junkers. They were usually younger men, between 17 to 25, sometimes younger or even older, depending on their physique. They had to be nimble little monkeys, as they had to climb up into the mast to work the sails and yards, located above the lower mast. The smaller you were, the farther up you went. It was not a good job if you were afraid of heights, and in an age before safety equipment and lifelines, one of the most hazardous employments aboard a sail ship. When setting a topsail, you'd cling to the yard and balance your feet on a foot rope below, something which a lot of green yunkers likely would have swayed back and forth on. In the everyday you'd risk losing your grip and plummeting to a backbreaking fall on the ocean or deck below. Now imagine doing so in a storm. The idea of assigning the younger, more inexperienced and nimble men to the most dangerous part of the ship is akin to the ancient battlefield tactic, where the front line is made up of younger, inexperienced recruits, whereas the back line is made up of a veteran reserve. Of course, it was a largely practical decision based on physique. Still, pirates would often skip this tactic altogether, choosing either not to risk their own lives or the lives of their comrades, and instead appointing their forced men or slaves as top men. Pirates are often portrayed as allies of the downtrodden and, and liberators of slaves. And whilst this may have been a case a couple of times in the largely forgotten but extremely brutal Second Golden Age, taking place in the early 19th century, when many privateers worked with the nascent Republic of Haiti, this was certainly not a case in the Golden Age we're familiar with. The pirates of the 17th and early 18th centuries were brutal slave masters who profited from the practice, and at several points in time, they basically managed the industry. Slaves were incredibly convenient, because unlike other trade items, which is how pirates viewed slaves, they could move themselves and fulfill multiple purposes. The primary purpose was to sell them for a profit, but the pirate might also take slaves as a personal payment, or even a compensation for sustained injuries. Until that point, slaves were used to perform various menial duties across the ship, anything the pirates couldn't be bothered to do themselves. There are various eyewitnesses or second-hand sources, that describe the employment of slaves among pirates, but they're seldom detailed. In some cases it is simply said that the pirates had blacks aboard, leaving their status ambiguous. In other cases it is stated that they were kept for performing drudgery, cleaning, and manning the pumps. The best available source for the actual life of a pirate slave comes from the account written by Alonso Ramirez. Ramirez is interesting, he was a Puerto Rican carpenter captured by the buccaneers of William Dampier, but his status aboard the pirate ship is uncertain. He may have been treated as a slave, a forced man, or at some points, even a regular one. While some of the events in his book have obviously been exaggerated in order to aggravate the Spanish audience, other bits appear comparatively plausible. Ramirez recounted a legion of assignments rendered unto him by the pirates. The buccaneers forced Ramirez and his compatriots to man the pumps, clean the ship, and maintain the pirates' weaponry. They made candles, twisted rope, and made repair materials. The slaves worked as cooks, hulling rice, soaking it, and grinding it into flour. They made shoes and clothes, and even worked as barbers, shaving the pirates every Saturday. As for food, the buccaneers would feast on meat and fresh coconuts having so much that they'd just drink the milk and throw the shells into the water. The slaves, meanwhile, were only fed a small amount of rice, parboiled in seawater. When one of the slaves displeased the pirates, they were whipped, and torch was frequent, often as a form of entertainment. Another Spaniard that fell sick was treated to a special medicine. The captain uh, took a crap in a bucket, mixed it with water, and fed this repulsive gruel to the Spaniard at knife point. The Spaniard vomited repeatedly, but by chance managed to recover. 
from that point on, the same treatment was prescribed to any slave that became ill. Of course, there was a huge racial aspect to New World slavery. Pirates attacked slave ships straight from Africa, but they also robbed plantations, or even just regular ships. Black sailors made up a huge part of merchant crews in the New World, both free and enslaved. Unpaid black laborers were so common aboard Bermuda sloops that the government had to restrict it in order to prevent white unemployment. Pirates could enslave free blacks, or even mixed people, as well as Native Americans, Hispanics, and even Hindustanis. Of course, the dynamic could be completely flipped on its head. Spanish privateers in the Caribbean were often Native American, black, or mixed race. And if they captured white pirates, they would employ them as slaves aboard their own ships, manning the oars, grinding maize for provisions, and even sell them to gentlemen in Mexico. A few of these pirates would escape, others would be liberated. Spanish privateers would also liberate Spanish-speaking slaves, regardless of skin color. During the 1687 raid on Petit Guave, a mixed-race force of Spanish corsairs managed to liberate a score of slaves, who had begun rioting during the attack. However, these corsairs also had colored slaves in their own crew. All in all, the situation was pretty complicated. It shouldn't be assumed that pirates were any nicer to those of their own race. Whilst they couldn't sell whites into slavery per se, they could still enslave them aboard their own vessels. There was this incident aboard a ship of Steed Bonnet, where a free mulatto pirate started berating a forced white man, claiming he should be, quote, treated as a negro. But more often than not, white quote-unquote slaves were treated better than other races aboard pirate ships, and known as forced men. It was the pirate equivalent of press ganging, a naval practice in which groups of cudgel armed recruiters go around port, coercing, beating, and kidnapping free sailors to serve the Royal Navy during wartime. It is often said that piracy was a refuge for press ganged sailors, but during peacetime, when piracy flourished, press ganging wasn't practiced by the Navy, who only employed volunteers. In the 1720s, pirate crews had considerably more forced men than the Navy did press gangers. It really mustn't be underestimated how cruel, selfish, and nihilistic the pirates of this period really were. You might be wondering how forcing worked anyway. When pirates captured a ship, they would either seek willing recruits, or if they really needed specialists, or just regular sailors, they would force them. Some forced men were made to sign the pirates' articles, technically making them part of the crew, but others refused, and still kept their lives. Though the treatment obviously varied from crew to crew, forced men generally seemed to have been treated better than slaves or prisoners, as the pirates hoped to keep them compliant, and maybe even recruit them. Forced men were given equal provisions, including alcohol, and some even carried weaponry. A slaver named William Snellgrave was protected from his pirate captors by one of their forced men, named James Griffin, without ever being rebuked by the pirates. Manning the helm, that is the steering mechanism, seems like one of the most important and prestigious postings aboard a ship, but every sailor was expected to know it, and the task was often given to slaves and forced men. They would either have the captain or sailing master give them orders as to directions, or keep a heading by the aid of a target, like an island or a ship, or the binnacle, a large compass kept in a stationary glass container. If a forced man did not steer as well as the captain imagined, he might be punished. One forced helmsman was cut eleven times in his head, though the blows weren't deep enough to go beyond the skin. The employment itself was unpleasant, as you'd stand there for long periods regardless of the weather, the whipstaff straining against you, causing bruises on your elbows and along your arms. Even if they had some freedom, there was a lot of psychological pressure on forced men. Some were continuously enticed by promises of riches and freedom, others kept in solitary confinement, deprived of provisions and even subject to torture. Pirates were actually afraid of their forced men, or the prospect of them rising up in a mutiny. The best way to prevent them wasn't to keep the weapons away, as pretty much anything aboard a ship can be weaponized, but rather to have them under constant watch. Ships were small spaces, and pirates knocked down the internal partitions that created rooms. There was no place to conspire, or even have a private conversation, without drawing suspicious attention. Forced men often had to communicate with glances or expressions or just a turn of an eye. And if a forced man drew too much attention, or, pray tell, decided to escape, they'd be punished. Usually it amounted to a flogging, but some forced men were left marooned on a desert island or an unprovisioned boat. In the best case, the forced men could carry out a successful mutiny, 
This only really happened in the latter days of the Golden Age, when piracy had become so dangerous as to make it unappealing, and pirates had basically no other option but to force new recruits. This often resulted in the forced men outnumbering them, making them harder to control. After the pirates had been killed or captured, the forced men would carry them to the nearest port and surrender, hoping that their compliance would be enough evidence to save them from the noose, which it usually was, and they were often richly rewarded with items from the pirates' cargo. If you're familiar with pirates, you probably heard the phrase, swab the deck. The swab was a sort of mop, made from a bunch of old rope yarns, and was used to clean the decks and cabins of a ship. In turn, the guy appointed to swabbing was called a swabber. The exact definition of swabber depends on the source. Some regard him simply as the individual ordained to swabbing, others call him the lowest ranking officer, ordained to keep the vessel neat and tidy. He was supposed to have the vessel washed once, twice, or every day of the week, and to prevent infection, he was supposed to burn pitch or tobacco below deck, to force away the festering stench. People in this era believed that sickness was transmitted by smell, miasma theory. The swabber was also supposed to keep an eye on every man's sleeping place, to make sure they kept them clean, something which sailors were often bad at. Basically, the swabber was the ship's janitor, but he didn't do it for free. In the navy, he was paid four shares. A similar position to the swabber was the liar, who did actually do it for free, but not voluntary. Every Monday, the first man to be caught in a lie was proclaimed so at the mainmast by the crew crying, a liar, a liar, a liar. He'd keep this title for the next week, and his assignment was to relieve the swabber in his most uncomfortable task, that is, cleaning the beakhead and chains. These were the shipboard toilets. If you had to relieve yourself aboard a pirate ship, you'd normally pull down your pants along the side, or do it into a piss tail, a sort of basin built into the top side with a lead pipe leading the urine down along the hull. For number two, you'd either squat down on the channel, a protruding bit of woodwork used to hold the shrouds, a standing rigging keeping the mast in place, which you'd grab onto for support. This wasn't exactly safe, so the better alternative was to use the head, the beak-shaped platform at the front of the ship, furnished with hold, wooden seats, leading right into the ocean below. Urine and feces would fall along the hull, and require cleaning up, lest it started to smell, especially in the tropics. Not exactly a fun assignment. Basically, don't lie, or at least don't be caught in it. Of course, pirates probably delegated this assignment to their slaves and forced men. An honorable mention goes out to shipboard musicians. Normally on a sailing ship, musicians like trumpeters and drummers were used as announcers when signaling a ship or an attack or heralding a holiday. A fiddler or an oboe might play during the officer's dinner. So overall it wasn't a bad assignment, but things were a bit different on a pirate ship. Pirates figured they should enjoy the same luxury as naval officers, every man, and all around the clock, not only at dinner. The problem was that free musicians didn't always want to join them, and didn't always want to play around the clock, so you guess it, they forced them, and they made them play all around the clock. However, some pirates gave them rest on Sunday, so they had that privilege. Sometimes. A second honorable mention, which I came up with quite a bit later, is the Forlorn Hope. This was basically the vanguard, the guys you'd send in first into any combat situation. When marching on land, pirates would let the Forlorn take the front and brunt of any ambushes. When attacking a city, they'd be rushing the walls with axes, pistols, and grenades. The same when boarding a ship, then you'd be susceptible to enemy firearms, spike traps, exploding traps, hidden artillery, boarding combat was unpleasant. So get over her, scum. But you might think, oh, they'd be given a high reward. It doesn't seem as though this was commonplace. While certain feats in battle were awarded, partaking in the Forlorn never seems to have been especially awarded. Neither was it voluntary. Your position in the Forlorn was chosen by the throw of a die. So you better hope that Lady Fortune is on your side. Now, a quick word from today's sponsor. Do you like money? Do you have a child aged between 6 and 13 years of age? Do you want to sell it? Then head down to the Sign of the Mermaid in Bristol Town and meet with Captain John Jean, the sponsor of this video. Captain Jean is always looking for new able hands aboard the ship because he keeps abusing them to the <coughs> because he's always offering new opportunities to the young generations. 
he'll be able to offer you as much as 20 pounds for which you can buy a new wig. So head on down today to the sign of the mermaid in Bristol and sell your child to Captain John Jean. Golden Powder does not take into account the inflation of prices between 1696 and 2023, nor are we responsible for your child's sunny grounds, suffocates, false ill, false from a high place, is eaten by shark, kidnapped by pirates, the French, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the Danish, Indians, Africans, Moors, or Chinese, man to death by walrus, is pained, flogged, begins by torture, racked, mutilated, pickled, or has its teeth replaced by wooden shingles. Thank you to Captain John Jean for sponsoring this video. Please hit the subscribe button and notification bell. I didn't put any of these assignments into any particular order, I mostly just listed them based on segue ability. But it could definitely be argued that being a cabin boy was the worst assignment aboard a pirate ship. Because no one should really have to spend their childhood among a violent bunch of foul-mouthed, stinking criminals. Children were a relatively common occurrence aboard ships at the time, and they fulfilled a variety of purposes. Some might be brought aboard as cadets. The ship was a floating school for them to learn sailing and navigation, in order to become officers as adults. Others might be younger teenagers employed as regular sailors. Others might be the children of the officers, and some might even be owned by the officers, either as white, indentured servants, or colored slave boys. Pirates didn't have any cadet programs, but they did have young seamen, free boys, and even boy slaves. A very strange example lies in John King, one of the few pirates whose corpse has actually been found. Or, well, a small part of it. More on it in a bit. John King was 9 or 10 years old in 1717, when he and his mother were captured, the pirate had all intentions to let the passengers go, had King not begged them to let him join. He went so far as to threaten his mother with suicide, in case he was restrained. Either out of fear or amusement, the pirates took him aboard. A few months later, when the widow went under, John King met his untimely and early demise. When the shipwreck was recovered some 300 years later, the divers found the leg bone of a child wearing the remnants of a silken sock and a tiny leather shoe. What would King have been doing about a widow? Boys of that age were typically apprentice sailors, made to literally learn the ropes. They were used as servants, for attending the officers, but often the crew as a whole. Cooking them food, bringing them the food, cleaning up the food, and everything else. Lighting their pipes, fetching items, delivering messages, bringing people to the officers, whatever you can imagine. In battle, they were famously deployed as powder monkeys. The powder monkey had to fetch gunpowder to the gun crews during battle. All the while cannons roared and the men crowded the decks, they had to run through this mad labyrinth, clamber through the steep, narrow stairs to the dark decks below, make their way into the magazine, get the gunpowder without starting a single spark and blowing the whole ship up, and then get back up again. It would have been hectic, to say the least. There is of course the matter of sexual assault. Sodomy against cabin boys was enough of an issue in the Royal Navy, to warrant frequent enough court-martials, but its likelihood to occur aboard pirate ships is really hard to estimate. There is only one account of a buccaneer, Edmund Cook, being accused of buggering his servant boy. He was later released after a shift in the power dynamic, either indicating that the pirates didn't care, or that it was a false accusation. There is also the purported articles of Bartholomew Roberts, which also mentions how no boy or woman to be allowed amongst them. This item makes a point of outlawing women aboard to avoid sexual jealousy, and since boys are mentioned in the same sentence, it has been assumed by some that they were viewed from the same light, as a sexual object. However, some historians have disputed this. The item is vague, and may simply have meant that resources are scarce, we only want to spend them on able, grown men. Boys and women may have disrupted the manliness of the company. Neither is there enough evidence to prove widespread sodomy among pirates or the naval community as a whole in the Age of Sail, which even the famous J.R. Berg has admitted, stating that his book Sodomy and the Pirate Tradition is largely speculation. But the cabin boy experience could still be extremely unpleasant. A French dictionary mentioned how they were punished if they proved lacking, and, quote, are so little spared than even others. Some were even chastised once a week, for no other reason apart from discipline, other times, because the captain simply didn't like him. One extreme example laid in Captain John Jean, he was later executed for his actions against the cabin boy. He had his cabin boy whipped and pickled, strung up to the mast for nine days and nights, with his limbs fully extended, dragged across the deck, kicked, and force-fed excrement. It took 18 days for him to die, despite being whipped every day. Just before expiring, he asked for a glass of water. 
the captain gave him a glass of urine. Even pirates would struggle to achieve John's levels of cruelty. And indeed, many boys joined him willingly and were even paid for their efforts. But if the boy was an indentured servant, his share would go directly to the owner. Same went for slave boys. Owning a colored slave boy, who might be Native American, black or mixed race, was a status symbol in the age of sale. Pirates could buy them, steal them, trade them between each other. Bartholomew Sharp was gifted one by his crew, or kidnapped them from their own mothers. One of the most horrific examples was related by William Dampier. In Mexico, Captain Swan and Townley forced a mother of four to serve as a pilot, helping them find and rob a mule caravan. When this was done, the woman was rewarded and released, but Swan had taken a liking to one of her boys and decided to keep him. The mother cried and begged hard for him not to do so, but the captain did not listen. According to Dampier, Swan seems to have been kind to the child, but who knows. And those were the five jobs which I'd consider the worst aboard a pirate ship, in no particular order. Tell me in the comments which one you thought were the most horrific, and maybe if you're lucky, I won't assign you to it aboard my ship. Thank you to my generous supporters over on Patreon. Patreon supporters get early access to my videos and can watch them without ads. And if you want to interact with fellow pirate enthusiasts, check out the link to our Discord server in the video description. Cheerio!